Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week as a special tribute to an extraordinary and legendary Scottish actor, Sir Sean Connery, who sadly just passed away at the ripe age of 90 on Halloween last week. Um, he has always been a charming, brought in a lot of sheer elegance and brilliance in his entire career. He was a very talented and very gifted actor. Um, best known for playing James Bond, and he was the first man to do so, even though originally it was going to be Cary Grant to play the part. And then only did uh, his first film, Dr. No, uh, joining in with um, with seven uh, James Bond features before, well, back and forward, uh, they had George Lazenby for just one James Bond film, and then it follows along with Roger Moore, who's no longer with us either. And then later we had Timothy Dalton, and also my favorite too, uh, Pierce Brosnan, only leads to, in current times, Daniel Craig, which is latest uh, James Bond film has yet to be released, and I hope it does because it's taking forever. Um, but therefore, I always love this actor. Aside from being another favorite of mine for James Bond, um, joining in with Pierce Brosnan, I do love Roger Moore and Timothy Dalton. I didn't mind George Lazenby and I do love Daniel Craig um, but nevertheless uh, Connery just uh, had just bought in the spirit in me um, when he did a lot of uh, great films to follow when he's not playing James Bond and, and he retired from the role um, he went on to do films like The Man Who Would Be King I know he did Zardos and other ones too I could think of. Uh, the one film I did enjoy um, even during the 70s though he did a film called The Great Train Robbery uh, with Donald Sullivan and Leslie Ann Down. That was actually a very thrilling uh, adventure comedy and it was very fun to watch and I love the chemistry between the two and all. Then he went on to do films that follows around, like he did Outland, which is a space western of sorts, uh, that was directed by Peter Himes. Um, and he did, um, he, he did went on to do other films that I definitely enjoy in his career, like I love The Name of the Rose, uh, that was based on a novel, sort of like... Uh, a Sherlock Holmes that's being set in the monastery times, you know, with the monks and all. Uh, he was um, he was in the movie The Untouchables, which earned him an Oscar for for his performance. Uh, he did, um, yeah, he did, of course, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, you know, playing the Indies' father. And yeah, he was definitely the best thing about the film too, which which is of course a very truly awesome sequel. And he also went on to do The Hunt for Rod October. It was directed by John McTiernan, uh, based on the Tom Clancy novel that's part of the Jack Ryan series. And he did like so many movies that I love that I really enjoy and the movie that I'm actually going to be reviewing today is the one that I also love, uh, mostly because he has a supporting role in this uh, particular story, and that is Highlander. There can be only one. Yeah. Which is the central theme of immortality. A story about a Scottish warrior in the Highlands who eventually becomes an immortal. He joins uh, with uh, Ramirez, who 
who's um, who joins with an Egyptian, but sort of a Spaniard, a mortal himself, where he's about to teach him how to do all the lessons that he had to use to summon the power, and also to actually beheaded um, his enemy, which that turned out to be Kurgan. Yeah. And yes, um, the Highlander himself is known as Connor McLeod, who's played by Christopher Lambert, and Juan Sanchez Belobos Marreras is played by Sean Connery, and Kurgan, murderous and definitely the terrific villain, is played by Clancy Brown. And of course, he's in the future, 1985. That was supposed to be the present time in New York City, where that's where he wants up meeting a, a forensic um, a, a forensic expert for the NYPD named Brenda, who's played by Roxanne Hart, who happens to be, well, sort of his second love interest after his first one, which was Petter. Okay. This is the Blu-ray that I picked up uh, back in 2018 that came in this wonderful VHS style slipcover which I showed you before. And as you can see, this actually uses the original cover art, uh, which I believe is from the international release. Because in the US, North America, it was released by 20th Century Fox, which is now owned by Disney. <laughs> Well, now referred to as 20th Century Studios, um, but at the time um, they had a different uh, poster art, which was just Christopher Lambert. And at the time, uh, Lambert was just um, beginning to become a rising star after his debut with uh, the film *Great Stroke: The Legend of Tarzan*. Yeah, he played Tarzan, but he was also in a Luc Besson film called *Subway*. And this was the film that would definitely made him a bigger star, and also the film that eventually became a very popular film. It became a franchise of all the sequels that follow, a TV series, an animated series, and even an anime. I mean, people really loved this film so much. Um, however, critics at the time upon its release, well, in the U.S. alone, or North America, uh, they panned the film critically, saying that it's absurd, it's cheesy, it's silly, it's stupid, but yet uh, the audience who saw the movie probably saw it for a different reason, and or perhaps maybe the same reason. Now, I saw Highlander on home video and on TV, and I, I love this movie so much because of it, because of the story, the central theme of immortality, about what would it be like if, if you're an immortal and you want to spending the entire generations living so long, you can't die, you're, you're incredibly young, um, you can't age, but you want to um, experiencing everything that happened throughout these centuries, you get to do whatever you want. And also, you get to hang out with all your friends, um, especially the ones who are immortals. But the sad part is, even with your love of your life that you just never forget, well, they end up growing old, they're not immortals, and they eventually die. And that's how sad you would probably feel, so of course, over the years he had gotten used to it, but he still feels pretty bad about it. That's why he's afraid of, of the living, in, in a way. But what makes this movie uh, awesome to me was that it blends in not only with the story, it throws in a mix of action and adventure, I mean with these awesome sword fights that they put into it. Um, a lot of uh, comic elements that you put into, you know, with some tremendous dialogue throwing in. Yeah, some are silly, campy-ish, but at times, you know, you just you just get the idea once uh, you watch it and understand more. 
and um, a lot of great romance to follow too. And of course, I mean, you get a terrific villain to follow, and everything that went along with it. Also, you got a kick-ass soundtrack by Queen. You know, Freddie Mercury's band with a lot of awesome songs that I could never forget. My favorite songs of the soundtrack are Magic, that was in the end credits. Uh, I, I love all these other songs that were right in, into the film too that I, I'm totally familiar with. And I know originally they were going to add one song just for the movie itself, but yeah, maybe for the opening credits, but technically it told the story straight, so the, the songs themselves were actually written for the film. And it also brought in a wonderful score by Michael Kamen uh, that gives it a, a Scottish feel at times uh, during the central themes. And then they throw in some other, a lot of uh, soothing mixes, and then it gets a, a, a very haunting score at times. Uh, it's just incredibly thrilling, and that's why I love it so much. And yeah, you can see the back. Uh, but if you take out um, the slipcover, of course, um, yeah, the, f the special features are on here too. It has the audio commentary uh, with the director, Russell McKay. Yeah, because he's the director uh, best known for giving us several of the um, Duran Duran music videos. Um, his first film happens to be a horror film from Australia called Razorback. So this is how he got the, the chose to... The, this is how he was chosen to direct this. Yeah, and it got deleted scenes as well. Um, however, seeing that this is the 30th anniversary edition right here, uh, that was released in 2016, it's digitally remastered. I believe it's a 4K remastered and restored uh, the way it should be, uh, destined for this release. Um, it does contain a making of Highlander. Uh, which is actually from the 2006 DVD release um, in Germany, I believe. It was a, t if you put it together, it's, a, it's actually a two-hour uh, documentary where it had um, it had the writer uh, Gregory Ridden, who actually came up with this story as part of a uh, a project uh, for his screenwriting class at UCLA Film School, which is based upon the the Ridley Scott film The Duelist with Harvey Keitel. It's inspired by it, and I could, which led to this whole story about about sword fighting and you know who was going to live or who was going to die, and that really went for it. I mean, the teacher approved it, and now he took this original script and decided to turn it into a movie. And of course, it had some of the people behind it too and, and even an interview with uh, Roxanne Hart. Uh, there was a new interview uh, with the director Russell Mulcahy and an actor uh, Christopher Lambert or sometimes referred to him as Lambert. Yeah, the French actor as we all know who plays the part of Conor McLeod. And there's also an archival interview with him that was done in French uh, from Studio Canal. Uh, it also has a commentary, as I mentioned, and in the trailer, which the trailer actually uh, is from the international release that was, well, originally it was released by Foreign EMI Screen Entertainment, which eventually would become Canon Films uh, after they merged with EMI in overseas. So I think that's exactly what they were going for here. It's almost starting to feel like a canon film, really. <laughs> but it wasn't really meant to be. Okay. So let's... Um, anyway, let's um, get to the review of this wonderful, awesome movie. It stars uh, Christopher Lambert, uh, Sean Connery, Clancy Brown, Roxanne Hart, Vito Eckney, Alan North, John Polito. Yeah, and he was uh, quite skinny back then, and quite young too, uh, before he gained weight and 
and you look quite different. But he's no longer with us. So. Uh, Sheila Gish, uh, Hugh uh, Kwashi, Christopher Malcolm, Peter Diamond, Celia Amery, and Coran Russell. Yeah, it's written by Gregory Whitten, uh, joined by Peter Bellwood and Larry Ferguson, and it's directed by Russell McKay. And this is the same director who also went on to do not only the sequel to Highlander, but he also went on to direct the movie uh, Ricochet uh, with Denzel Washington and John uh, Lithgow, as well as uh, Ice-T. And he also directed uh, The Shadow with Alec Baldwin, John Lone, Anel B. Ann Miller, Ian McKillen, Tim Curry, <laughs> even James Hong. The movie began set in New York City in 1985. We meet uh, Connor McCloud, who's played by Christopher Lambert, who was given a different name, simply called Richard Nash, who actually owns an antique shop that was basically his home. Um, he just went to a wrestling match in Madison Square Garden where he was already being confronted by his old enemy, Iman Fassell, in the parking garage. That's where we had a sword duel fight between the two, which leads to incredible stunts right there. Uh, some amazing uh, sword fighting and all. You know, through all, all the rest of the cars around. And then after that, he finally uh, beheaded uh, Fassell. Yeah, decapitated him by cutting his head off. And that's where the quickening starts. Once he says the line, there could be only one. And the quickening is, is a powerful energy that results from one immortal killing another. And it releases the effect that causes the entire garage to explode you know with all the cars around you know all the windshields glass had been breaking the cars destroying and all and now he summons the power of the quickening so he's of course immortal so then uh, Connor hides his sword on the rooftop of the parking garage and starts to escape driving a car until um, he got caught by the NYPD um, detaining him for murder and was later released uh, due to the lack of evidence that was going around. Uh, that's where we meet uh, a forensic uh, scientist named Brenda White, who's played by Roxanne Hart, who is actually the expert to help investigate the strings of beheadings in New York City that's going around and also trying to find out about the sword that she just found that was at the parking garage of what turned out to be of course I'm in for sales. Then we get to see a series of flashbacks uh, for Connor's history where in the Scottish Highlands in 1546 Connor is indeed a warrior known as the Highlander and he's about to enter his first battle as the Fraser Khan at war with the McClung Cow, the McLeod Can. So the Frasers are being aided by Kurgan, who's played by Clancy Brown, who happens to be the last of the Kurgan tribes, was in exchange for his wife to slay Connor. But right in battle, just when he was almost ready to beheaded him, um, he actually stabs uh, McLeod, and then um, as fatally as possible, and then he was driven off before he was getting a chance. But he makes a complete recovery, and he was accused of basically witchcraft. Yeah, now we're going for this particular story here. <laughs> but the clan actually wishes to kill him at, at first. But Chief Tan Ingus mercifully exiles him and have him banish by wandering around the highlands, becoming a blacksmith 
and wants up marrying a beautiful woman that turned out to be Heder. Uh, therefore, we meet another immortal who I guess at first was supposedly a Spaniard, but actually he was originally an Egyptian named Juan Sanchez Badalopos Ramirez, also known as Don Juan. He was played uh, brilliantly by Sean Connery. Um, he finds Connor after tracking his old foe, which turned out to be Kurgan, somewhere in Scotland, tries to um, help him out, becoming his mentor, explaining that that to him, the Kurgans um, were actually immortals themselves. They were born that way and destined to battle each other, save on holy ground. When only a few of them were left, um, they were drawn somewhere to a faraway land from the gathering and battled for the prize. Which, for all the power of, of the immortals around, but for time, yes, they're going to try to pass from from one warrior to the other. And, and yes, if if the Kurgan suddenly beheads uh, the next warrior over the other, yeah, he's going to get uh, the quickening and he'll become as powerful than ever. Now, Connor on the other hand only wants to have a quiet life, have a family of his own with, with Heather, hoping that this will be the perfect time, a perfect century, and, and hoping love will last forever, even though that's never will be. Because Ramirez reveals that immortals cannot have children and believe that they must assure evil people like the Kirkin to not win the prize. Or as humanity will suffer for the eternity of darkness, as he explained. So, <laughs> Ramirez then explains the overriding beliefs of all immortals, but in the end, of course, the line, there can be only one. So since then, um, Romero started to train McLeod, <laughs> now but they hope, <laughs> and they eventually became friends. I mean, yeah, there was some jokes that's throwing it around, like where um, I, I I know it's kind of interesting too, just reading it because seeing that um, Sean Connery is Scottish himself, yeah, well it was when he was alive. Um, seeing that he's actually playing. A Spaniard or an Egyptian, while <laughs> Christopher Lambert, who is a a Swiss French actor himself, is playing a Scottish uh, man, and it's just it's crazy. But I guess that was the idea here. Um, so yeah, they they've been going around. They experience everything that Ramirez had taught him. So hoping he'll be a true warrior and a mortal and and he'll be able to you know, do whatever he wants here, if he can, and also continue hunting and going after Kurgan. So that was what we experienced here. But then one night, while Connor's away for hunting, Kurgan finds and wants a dueling uh, Ramirez, who actually wants McLeod to be ready for him, and that's why he's preparing for it. So then, what's sadly led to the scene where now Kurgan eventually kills uh, Ramirez, you know, by decapitating him and summon all of his power of the quickening. So now he becomes immortal. So, of course, years later, Heather dies of old age, prompting Connor to wander Earth and adopts Ramirez's katana sword as his own which is a unique weapon that was made by a Japanese genius in the in 593 BC yeah. which he did uh, once married a Japanese princess before she died but now going back to 1985 which was the, the present time back then now it's becoming the time of the gathering so when Kurgan finally arrives by compelling to come to New York, where Connor now lives as an antique dealer, 
that he runs. He's joining in with his uh, confidence, uh, Rachel Ellenstein. Um, it also reveals that, well, I guess if you watch the director's cut, that that Rachel turned out to be McLeod's adopted daughter. Um, so I know in, in the theatrical cut it didn't really explain. So I, I know they had to uh, add some differences here. Which at that point on, uh, she was a child that was rescued by the Nazis during World War II. And while uh, Brenda was uh, continuing to uh, find the shards of Connor's sword um, that happened during the murder scene, uh, she came back. She found uh, Connor, which at this point on, you know, they Connor was just about to have a drink at, at a local bar and just explaining what's going on. And he was just wondering maybe, you know, she might take her in or so. But of course, she can take care of herself, as she said. She later did went to his place which is the antique shop and that's where he discovered his entire room filled with a lot of artifacts and a lot of books all the way around as you can see uh, it looks very beautiful the way um, this building really looks it almost looks like an, an, an art um, like an art dealer um, shop or any other kind but it's a perfect apartment that he had to live in uh, Anyway, um, but before long, I mean, Connor actually was about to give, um, uh, Connor was about to give, um, Brenda a gift, only to discover that he's being, uh, recorded, um, and was being, uh, watched, uh, by a cop, um, outside. So knowing that this was going to be a setup, so yeah, he discovered that. Trying to find out the truth about what's going on, and therefore, Brenda would later uh, confront Connor to find out his true identity. After she started searching the name of Richard Nash to know who he really was. And he turned out that he's actually an immortal and he can't die. And after spending the night together, yeah, they had sex. Uh, they fell in love. But then Kurgan, uh, who actually had stayed over at a local hotel for a while and just to prepare for his uh, attack on Connor, yeah, that's where we're going to lead to that. Uh, he soon had later. Um, attack uh, one of uh, Connor's friends uh, at the alley which then one cop uh, came by he grabbed he was like in going undercover as like a uh, a punk and he had like so many guns he's just going around um, trying to find out what's going on and it was ready to shoot Kurgan but then just when he already beheaded um, Connor's friend that uh, yeah it's the black man he got the power. The entire um, the entire buildings were exploded with filled with glass going around. And then the cop was ready to shoot him, Kurgan. Of course, he's not dead. You know, he had blood spurting around, but of course, he's immortal. And he wants up stabbing the um, the cop uh, with the sword, but surprisingly lives. And he, he actually recovered. Wants up in the hospital for recovery to explain what was happening and then later on I mean both Connor and and Kurgan had met at church <laughs> Kurgan went under the skies he shaved his head and this is where they're they're preparing for the duel that's gonna follow afterwards and and we remember that line that Kurgan said like I always said it's better to be burned out then the fade away. <laughs> then later on, Kurgan kidnaps Brenda. Um, he stole the car and winds up driving around throughout the streets, ends up um, 
pretty much crashing everyone. Yeah, almost crashing all these cars around, but all the cars have been crashing. And all and basically run over several people here. Even run over the guy in the motorcycle until they wound up going straight into the Silver City Studios uh, tower where they're going to lead to um, the climax of the film, which is the sword duel between Connor and Kurgan. Where Kurgan trapped uh, Brenda on the top of the the neon sign that's at Silver City Studios and that's when the battle begins uh, everything started to collapse from the roof even the water tower starts to, to fall down and splash everywhere uh, with all the, the letters of the neon starts to fall apart and, and uh, Brenda was being tied up over there is ready to fall too but she hanged on and then it would lead to the final act into inside the building where that's where they finally made their match and Connor had beheaded uh, Kurrigan and now he gets the quirkening after he says the line there could be only one and that's where we get to see uh, how he finally gets the power and you see all these uh, all these um, animated um, creatures uh, flying around here and there and it just brings them to life and since then now both Connor and Brenda are together and they want to uh, go all the way to the Scottish Highlands where he was from and they just had a picnic together just experiencing the entire um, land while we get to hear the narration of Ramirez and the movie ends uh, happily. Uh, no doubt about it, this was an awesome movie. Very beautiful, very wonderful. Simply my favorite movie of the franchise. But of course, I have a lot of favorites too. <laughs> I know. And simply um, the only movie that's the best one that we ever got. And I know I saw this movie on TV when I was a kid, you know, even on home video. I loved it. And I still do, even today. <laughs> and I always will be. And the transfer is a whole lot better than all the previous releases we have. I mean, seeing that Lionsgate had teamed up with Studio Canal to release it, uh, they did actually have the sequel on Blu ray. But now that's been out of print. Yeah, sadly. Um, the movie had a small budget of 19 million, but it was, at the time, a little big. As the equivalent at the time, it would probably be like over, maybe almost 200, perhaps. A very merciful uh, budget uh, that really works. Um, it only had a small success of 12.9 million in North America didn't do very well as, as they were hoping they would be so I mean the way it was marketed this way and the way they advertise it I mean causes um, a critical reception but then over the years it did got evaluated uh, I think the audience loved it more than the critics did and, and I know I have over the years but I love it for for many reasons though of course it's the story and the idea of immortality, like, imagine, you know, you'd be able to do whatever you want. Um, you know, in, you know, staying young forever, you get to experience all these other centuries, you can't die at all. Um, there was actually that one moment that I really loved, too, was when uh, uh, Connor was in another time where the, he was just going around fencing. And eventually, you know, he gets stabbed. A couple times until he finally gets it right. <laughs> it's sort of like um, an old um, time warp switcheroo here. <laughs> yeah, like Groundhog Day in a way. Or like video games too, you know, like they always do that. But then at the end, uh, the guy who, who stabbed him winds up getting shot <laughs> and he dies. I, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, uh, I, I love the cast. 
that were given to Christopher Lambert. This was really his story here. His excellence as Connor McCloud. I mean, this is the kind of guy that you really want to root for. Uh, Sean Connery was just, just awesome, excellent, and even though I kind of wish that he was in the movie more, still, I, I definitely see the terrific chemistry between uh, Lambert and and Connery all together, and it shows, and they, it just shows how. How that you know they could work together as a team someday if this ever happens, or and it shows how how the power of friendship can be, you know even if they're trying to get along for a while. Um, the training scenes in the movie was amazing too. Where there was one scene where he was actually trying to explain to Ramirez, you know, even though he found out that he actually lied to him, he was talking about you know Haggits. And then he'd say, what's haggits? It's sheep gut. But what would you do with it? You eat it. And then he was like walking the boat because unfortunately he can't swim. So when he fell off, he felt like uh, he was going to die. But he told him, no, you can't die. You're an immortal. So, of course, he wants a breathing through water. <laughs> and he was amazing that he gets to walk through there. And all, all his other trained skills here and there and... It's just, it was fun. I, I, it's just sad now, now that Connery is gone, and I really miss him. I know he retired in 2004, I believe, or three. His last film turned out to be the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which could have been in in that same league as this, but I mean for its whole following. But I guess it just didn't seem to work that way. Um, but I still miss him so much. But back to the, the movie, uh, I thought Clancy Brown was uh, terrific as the villain, Kurgan. I mean, he's definitely uh, hammers it up in a very awesome way, the way he was portrayed. I mean, at times he does look like a punk when he's in New York City in the present time. But it definitely works this way. I mean, I mean this is the kind of villain you actually have to root for, too. Um, Roxanne Hart um, is a very strong um, character to play as uh, Brenda, a perfect love interest after uh, Heather. And Heather, of course, uh, was played by Beto Ekne. So that was his first wife before he, he ends up falling in love with Brenda. And she's very beautiful, too. And, and I, I remember one time I did set this in the review of Pulse, where I said, she was the equivalent of Amy Adams, like an 80s equivalent. Like she looks exactly like her, because she's a redhead and she has some of the facial features that she has. I could definitely see that too. So she was uh, very beautiful and and a perfect love interest uh, and chemistry uh, with McCloud. And a very uh, beautiful uh, sex scene too. <laughs> Uh, almost during the climax. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. And um, I, I love the way this movie really folds. I mean, they, they focus on many centuries, the way we saw it. And I love the sword fights. They're incredibly awesome. Uh, the special effects uh, for its time was was incredible, very stunning. I mean, they didn't use CGI back then. They just used uh, animation or any other uh, actual uh, visual effects that they have. It's on, all done practically, you know, with all the glass and all the sets design that they had to do to create these scenes. Everything that they were going to go for. And and that's another thing too. This film doesn't eat. And what's interesting is the film didn't age. It, it actually uh, stays true. I mean, considering that the movie came out in the 80s, it's, it still feels like a film that could have been made today. In some ways. But if it was made today, though, of course, they're going to use CGI effects. I mean, but that's okay, though. As long as it's good CGI effects and not bad ones. I mean... 
And the soundtrack, once again, by Queen was just amazing. I mean, this was really what's meant for this movie to be. Because now you know that you're watching a cult classic. I mean, you're having fun with this movie. It wasn't taking itself too seriously. It's not meant to be like Citizen Kane or The Godfather. It's just supposed to be just awesome fun, you know? That plays a role like in any other film we see these days. If you love action adventure, romance, comedy, drama, you know, with the conflict story behind what was happening that's very sad, you know, of, of immortality and all, this works. And that's why you should definitely check this movie out anytime, even if I had to spoil it for you. <laughs> and this is why it became so popular. I mean, because there could be only one. And in my opinion though, this should have been the only one that we could have had if, if this movie didn't have a sequel. But sadly that was the case, how I felt with uh, Highlander 2, The Quickening, which will soon become a Renegade, but it's actually both. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was nice to see Sean Connery again one last time, but I just wish uh, the film was just as amazing as the first Highlander was and it felt like an insult like they took everything away from it all and, and everything but in the end of the day um, the movie got better if you watch the Renegade cut that is I mean mostly because it did have a great cast it was great to see Lambert and Connery again I love um, Virginia Madsen I know she later went on to do Candyman, among other films. I always love that actress, and she's perfect for this. I, I do wish there were more romantic... Uh, I do wish there was a romantic uh, love interest between her and and um, McCloud in, in the movie. And we did have another villain that's quite similar to Kurgan, that's played by Michael Ironside, and the fact that it's set in a futuristic world. But still, that's just how I experienced. Um, and then, of course, we had the third movie that was just... Meh. Not very good at all. I didn't care for it. I gave up already at that point. Uh, the fourth one is the worst. It's awful. Endgame, which this time... Uh, Lambert teams up with uh, the TV star of... The Highlander series, uh, Adrian Paul, and that's what led to one of the worst sequels of all time, probably the worst, definitely the worst of the franchise, The Source. Yeah, and you know how that goes. Anyway, <laughs> but that's Highlander. There could be only one, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.